uh, involved really on the front line of this question, which is I know so important to uh, everybody who's here. Um, um, you heard it from a tira, but um, Michael Svard, or Michael Svard, however people are going to call you this evening, uh, is not only the author of this very good book, which I recommend to you, which you just heard is going to be signed, but also um, really the, the, the country Israel's leading human rights lawyer and advocate and involved in some of the most vexed questions uh, that have come before Israel's courts and that really are therefore the most vexed questions facing the country, including most recently uh, the issue of the legality of using live ammunition on the frontier, I don't think gar border is necessarily the right word, but the frontier, the fence uh, with Gaza, and we're going to talk a little bit about that very specific case, but really all the other cases that relate to occupation, whether they are about settlements, whether they're about the security barrier, whether they're about detention, uh, even child detention, relevant question given the news from the United States in the last two weeks, uh, wherever those cases are being fought and argued about, uh, our guest this evening is usually there. And I'm w hoping that the way we're going to do this, the format tonight, is that he and I will talk for a while about some of the questions the book raises, about some of the cases uh, uh, that, uh, that he has fought, and then obviously we're going to open it up for uh, a conversation and for uh, questions here. So, extremely grateful that you're here. Should we declare the family interest thing? Let's, let's do that right away. Okay. But Mike, Mike, just before we all started, said that one of the things was, was not mentioned on the CV and resume that Atira gave, the title besides excluding the fact that I write for the Jewish Chronicle, um, <laughs> which for me, some older members of my family was the only moment when they realised that I actually had a proper job. <laughs> um, but the other thing is that uh, this book was edited, really kind of midwifed into creation by a very eminent uh, editor in New York called Reva Hockerman, who happens to be my first cousin. <laughs> so, you know, it's a Jewish event. What can you do? Uh, so this is bound to happen. So, Michael, let's start straight away. I, there are, you know, you, the, the book is a survey really of not just your career, but of human rights in Israel and the legal struggle over them from bef before you were active, uh, but you are, do describe some of the cases you were involved in. And I just thought, because it's, a, it's such a direct issue, just to give people a flavor of your day-to-day -day work, just tell us about one of the cases, many here, that involve the settlements where you are there as an advocate, pick one, that you feel is illustrates the kind of work you and people like you are doing. Well, thank you, Jonathan. Good evening, everybody. I, I have to say I'm extremely excited by this turnout. Um, um, it's, it's moving, it's humbling, especially on a, on a football match night. Um, if so it had been tomorrow night, it might have been different. <laughs> <laughs> fair enough, well. fair enough. And yet, all these people preferred hearing about the israeli palestinian conflict rather than uh, watching uh, football. Um, well, I've been involved in the last two decades in, in, in many arenas and many cases um, that challenge practices and policies of the Israeli government, the Israeli army, in the occupied Palestinian territories. Um, I think it's difficult for me to choose a case to, 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 to describe because they were all my sons and daughters, but I think uh, one, of the, um, one of the formative cases was a case that I litigated uh, to uh, uh, demanding to uh, demolish and evacuate uh, an outpost. An outpost is the Israeli jargon for uh, a settlement that was not officially approved by the relevant uh, Israeli authorities. Uh, you might have heard of the name Amona. It's a, it's a uh, West Bank uh, outpost, uh, um, a group of uh, settlers that have trespassed into land that is privately owned by Palestinians, by villagers, into their farmland. Uh, and they have, uh, uh, um, uh, for two decades, for 20 years, lived on their, on, on their land. Um, and I met uh, um, a, a delegation of, uh, of the landowners uh, probably eight years ago or so, even more, maybe, maybe nine. Uh, and, um, and they asked me, can we, can we do something about it? Can we, can we evacuate these trespassers? We have filed complaints constantly with the Israeli civil administration. That's the arm of the, of the army that deals with civil affairs in the, in the occupied territories. And we were all the time uh, uh, um, promised that yeah, we will deal with it, but nothing really happens. And this outpost that started with, uh, with a cellular antenna and maybe two caravans is now ho housing more than 40 families, and it doesn't seem that they're going away. Um, this land was a registered land. That means that uh, the owners had deeds. They had proof 
um, that this is land be uh, that belongs to them. It sounds obvious that if someone has uh, property, they have deeds, but in the, in the West Bank, uh, about 70% of the West Bank is not registered at all. Uh, during the British mandate, uh, a registration process began, but, and Jordan continued it in the Jordanian, uh, during the Jordanian uh, rule, but it, when Israel uh, conquered the land, it stopped the registration process and only 30% actually finished this process. So in this case, we had uh, landowners that actually had deeds that cannot be any dispute that this is their land. My first year law studies, property law, it's the simplest case ever. It has almost no challenge. People trespassed into my property, I go to the police, I demand that uh, they will intervene, and, uh, and I have deeds and all. Well, this case taught me, I think, how um, simple legal issues, when they're saturated into complex political uh, uh, environment, can become extremely difficult cases. Um, this case was uh, litigated for more than uh, six years. At the end of which we won, we got a, a court order uh, to evacuate Amona, uh, and the court order stipulated that the evacuation has to, um, to uh, uh, be implemented within two years. It was Christmas of 2014 when the judgment was given, um, and then uh, uh, the deadline was 25th of December 2016. During those two years, the settlement lobby has done everything and it can, and even things they can't, do in order to, um, to cancel or to overcome the court ruling, including legislative uh, initiatives uh, that would circumvent the court uh, uh, order. Um, also, they initiated other proceedings to cancel the court order. We have been in court and out of court constantly in the two years that passed since I assumed the case was over. Uh, eventually, um, in this case, uh, the timing of the of the um, uh, evacuation or the deadline uh, combined with um, the Obama administration being still in power. Mm -hmm. And so for Netanyahu it was extremely difficult to resist uh, implementing the decision. But he did provide a kind of compensation for the settlers in the form of the what is termed as the regularization law. The regularization law was, is a law that was passed in February, 6th of February 2017, immediately at the aftermath of, uh, of the evacuation of Amona, in which uh, the, the Israeli parliament, for the first time, enacted the law that would apply to the West Bank, would order the military commander of the West Bank to uh, confiscate all lands that are privately owned by Palestinians to which Israeli settlers trespassed, and allocate those lands to the trespassers. So, and then a new case was born. And a month ago, I, I argued the case challenging the legality of the, of the uh, regularization. So in other words, Netanyahu's reaction was essentially to say, okay, we lost this case because the settlers were breaking the law, so let's change the law so it puts them on the right side of the law. If the rules of the game, uh, if I don't win in, in the current rules of the game, let's change the rules. Yeah. Um, so Netanyahu has uh, uh, supplied me with more work, more cases, um, and, uh, but, but, the, but the, the Amona uh, in outpost was evacuated uh, and moved to a different location. The first ever new official settlement that was uh, uh, created uh, after Oslo, because during, uh, uh, in the Oslo Accords in 1993, the Rabin government has declared no more <coughs> Uh, um, no more new settlements. Mm -hmm. And this is the first new settlement, it's called Amichai, it's in a different location. Um, and that begs the question, was it worth it? I, I have an answer, but I don't want to spoil your reading of the book. Yeah, <laughs> so we'll need to, to have some suspense with these things. So that's, a, that's an example. But, but I, I was curious yeah. whether this, the people who had brought the case did actually think in the end, what was the point of this? Okay. Because uh, we should mention, because Amona spawned those very famous photographs of the women settlers, I think, clashing yeah. with the uh, IDF, and it became a kind of iconic image, even right. just this tiny hilltop settlement, the evacuation was built up as if it's this big trauma, and so it yeah. becomes a disincentive to do it again. But in that case, they did change the law so that it, it, so you, it'll be harder for you to do it again. And I wonder whether you thought in some ways that was a kind of Pyrrhic victory, in other words, you've done it, but 
you paid a very heavy price. Well, first of all, let's wait and see what the Supreme Court uh, uh, will uh, rule on the legality of the regularization law. I don't want to jump ahead, but I, uh, after being in a hearing, it w it, the, the tribunal was extended to nine justices because it w it's such a, an important case. And there is a fair chance that the court would strike out this uh, law. Even the Attorney General, today's Attorney General in Israel is probably the most right-wing Attorney General we ever had, but even he uh, has sided with the petitioners, with us, saying this is not something that can be sustained. Um, the, pr the main problem with, uh, with uh, Amona, I think, uh, at the moment, uh, is that uh, the, the outpost was evacuated, but the land was sealed. And there are many excuses that the, that the army presents why it is not safe for the owners to go back to their lands. And we are now in a process of challenging the, 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 the military closed zone orders that were issued in order to um, satisfy the settlers' uh, fa not fantasy but uh, desire that the owners would not go back, that they would learn that it's not a good thing to deal with them, that even if they win the case and even if they manage to evacuate uh, the trespassers, they would not see the day that they go back to their lands. Now, I had other cases, similar cases, in which we did manage to get the, the owners back to their lands. I have, you know, eaten salads with olive oil that came from liberated lands like okay. this, and, uh, and, and it's a great, great uh, uh, um, satisfaction. But I have to say, my cli I, I met many Palestinian clients, mainly villagers, mainly people who work the land, mm. uh, cultivate the land, because this is where most of the friction happens, not in the cities, but except Hebron. Um, and I have to say, their inclination, their, um, um, their position is, we prefer to go down fighting mm. rather than... Um, rather than remain silent. There is something about the victimization that is much, much worse when the victim doesn't even have the chance to tell his, his or her story, to litigate, to make some kind of a, an act of resistance. Let's just get two sort of sets of basics I thought would be useful to get clear in people's minds because these things can be confusing. The first one I thought would be worth explaining because you mentioned the civil administration but the notion that there are two legal systems right. there, and that there you are as an Israeli lawyer <coughs> appearing and yet your clients are Palestinians who are not citizens. You know, just and there's, People may have seen the documentary The Law in These Parts that explains it but I think just walk us through it doesn't have to be long, but just the, how there are these two systems and where your kind of locus is, where you stand, given that. Well, it took me about 14 to 15 years to figure it out, okay. but I'll try to make it short. The West, uh, let, let's concentrate on the West Bank. Yeah. Gaza is a different story, very complex, but yeah. I don't want to get into... Uh, I'll just say that I do believe that Gaza is still under occupation. A different kind of occupation, but it is under occupation, but <coughs> legally speaking. The West Bank is under regular occupation. Which means that, uh, um, according to international law, the military commander of the force that occupies that land embodies the three uh, arms of government. He, I'm, I'm saying he because we never had a she in that position, he is the legislator, he is the judiciary, and he is, of course, the executive of the occupied territory. At the same time, he receives all the, these powers from the international law in order to maintain security and civil life until the end of the occupation. International law prescribes that occupation is a temporary situation that must end, and the occupying power, namely in this case Israel, has to strive to pursue the end of the occupation. Now, so international law is the first, is the, like the constitution of the occupation. Underneath that, we have the local law. And the local law in the West Bank is a, an embodiment of all of the different rulers the West Bank has had. So we have the military orders that the military commander is issuing. We have Jordanian laws, which Jordan has uh, legislated in the period of between 1949 and uh, 1967 when they, they were the rulers of the area. Then we have British mandatory ordinances yeah. and laws. And beneath that we have Ottoman laws, <laughs> which still, those laws that have not been cancelled by, by the other rulers. So this is like a kilt a patchwork, an archaeology of, of legislation. And that's what, in order to litigate in these areas, you need to, to understand all of these. Now, at the same time, 
we have another community in the West Bank, the settlers, because Israel has engaged in a huge enterprise of colonizing the territory in, co in, in direct con contravention of more, maybe the most important prohibition of international laws of, of occupation. We have hundreds of thousands of Israelis. They did not go to the occupied West Bank in order to feel that they are abroad, they are out of Israel. They wanted to bring Israel with them. And so the civil administration and the military commander has channeled throughout the years many Israeli laws through military orders to apply to those settlers. So what we have now is a Palestinian community that is under military law and military rule and laws of occupation and a, an Israeli community that is governed by, to a large degree, by modern democratic Israeli uh, pieces of legislation two neighbors living side by side. Let's take a, 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 a Palestinian from the, from the village of uh, Tkoa, mm. and let's take a settler from the settlement called also Tkoa. And they, let's, let's say they both commit the same crime, manslaughter, not connected to the conflict. They kill their neighbor for some reason. The Palestinian will be apprehended by the army. He will be brought before, he will be detained for up to eight days without seeing a judge. That's the military law. Then he will be brought before a military judge. The military judge can then extend his uh, uh, detention for, in, for, for the duration of the, of the investigation by up to 30 days at a time and up to th uh, three months altogether. And if he's charged with manslaughter, he will face up to life imprisonment, which is the maximum penalty for manslaughter uh, under the military law. His neighbor will be apprehended by the Israeli civil police, will be brought to a magistrate court in Jerusalem, a civil uh, a court, or depending where he lives, he will be, within 24 hours, because Israeli criminal procedure uh, stipulates that uh, a, a detained person must be brought before a judge within 24 hours. The extension can be up to 30 days altogether, seven days at a time, or 15 days up to 30 days. And if he's charged with a, a, a manslaughter, he will face a trial in the Israeli district court rather than the military court and face up to 20 years imprisonment because this is the maximum penalty under Israeli law. Two people living in the same geopolitical area, but are governed by different laws. How do you call it? Well, you do use the A word. I do use the A word. I was resisting the A word for many, many years. I remember hearing the A word, apartheid, for the first time um, um, in the context of the separation barrier, apartheid wall. And I, and, and you know, I, I'm a big believer in words. I, words are the bricks from which I do my artisanship, uh, I, 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 you know, this is the one thing that I really respect. Not one, there are many. My mother is here, I respect her. <laughs> my mom. Um, and so words are very important to me. And I remember saying, not every discrimination is apartheid and not every murder is genocide. You have to be careful with words. But some kind of doubt was remained in me. And I did what lawyers usually do when they have a, a big question. I opened the file. Mm -hmm. And I wrote on it apartheid question mark. And I started putting in it all kinds of documents that came to me throughout my work. And uh, started looking into it from time to time. And eventually uh, prepared a, 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 um, a presentation to a group that came. And I found out that I cannot resist that word. Mm -hmm. That even if. As a, as a lawyer, I can take the legal concept of the crime of apartheid and find some loopholes, some, some conditions that are not fully met. These are not the conditions that are at the heart of the moral wrong. And it, but you would be, I'm presuming, one of those people who applies the word apartheid to what's going on in the occupied territories in the West Bank rather than to pre-1967 absolutely Israel. Yeah. absolutely i don't i know that many people think uh and argue that israel itself is an apartheid state i i i uh dis i disagree completely i think this is a, a cheapening of a very uh of a very important uh, concept there are many many problems inside israel there is a systematic discrimination of palestinians of israeli Arabs uh, who have uh, Palestinians who have Israeli uh, citizenship, uh, but I do not believe that it comes anywhere close to apartheid. Uh, Israeli Israeli Arabs have 
um, the right to vote and to be elected to the parliament. It's true that th this right of them, this right is being diluted, is being uh, uh, um, countered and attacked all the time. Uh, and yet, there is a big difference between discrimination, even if it's systematic, and apartheid, which is a regime that, that wants to create this distinction and maintain it in order to have a domination of one group over another forever. Yeah. So you, the word accurately applied to the occupied territories, yes. inaccurately applied to Israel itself. Um, I want to get to the, the, the dilemma, which in a way is really runs through the, the heart of the book. And there was a specific case that you fought that sort of opened that up for you. And it does relate to the people, even this is a every, you talk about how important words are, the fence, the wall, the apartheid barrier. wall, the security, security barrier, barrier. It's, it's all the terms to tell people where you're coming from. But you know, we all know what we're talking about, but we'll call it the wall. Um, uh, you were involved in a case on that that sort of opened your eyes a bit. Why don't you tell us about that? You're talking about Berlin? In, yeah, I and mean, in 2007 in Berlin, yeah. Well, um, so there is a community um, just uh, west of Ramallah, um, a, a small village, not only no Israeli knew about it, but I think most Palestinians have never heard of it before, uh, um, before that uh, uh, affair. Uh, it's called Bilain. And Bilain uh, uh, is a small village, um, and, um, and when Israel has decided to erect the separation barrier, the route of the fence that, that uh, uh, went through the lands of Bilain left about half of their farmland, 2,000 dunams, on the Israeli side of the fence, on the, in what we call the seam zone, the area between the separation barrier and the green line. Mm -hmm. And that, that, that of course, uh, was, a, was a huge blow to uh, most of the families uh, of Bilin who were, do, uh, were uh, their livelihood dependent on these lands and their access to their, their farmland was uh, uh, almost completely denied. And, uh, and, and that, that uh, uh, route was realized, it was, it was built. Uh, the fence was there. When I uh, was asked to come to the village and meet uh, the, village he the head of the village council, and they asked me if I can, um, if I can take this route to, to court. Now, I'll, I'll, I don't want to get too much into this, but this was a, uh, a campaign that was, had the best combination you can have. We had a very strong case because the route went far, far away from the nearby settlement. So the idea that this route is about securing the lives of the people living in the settlement was completely bogus. And then we also found out that there are um, plans to build uh, a new neighborhood uh, in the area between the outer parts of the build-up area of the settlement and the, and the wall. So they built the wall far away, stating that it's for security, but then houses are supposed to run towards the fence. So we had a very, very strong case, but we also had a splendid uh, a community that engaged in non-violent struggle, a weekly, de weekly demonstrations, very creative, that attracted the international media, attracted Israeli activists, and created a, a symbol. Belin became a symbol. I remember the first, uh, in the first hearing, it was still, uh, uh, it was presided by the former uh, Chief Justice Aaron Barak, and I remember maybe two or three minutes after I began arguing, he said, Mr. Spart, can I ask you, what is so special about Belin? Why are they demonstrating so much there? And there was nothing special about Belin. They, their, their, uh, uh, um, the, the damage caused by the fence was not more, not less than in other villages. They just knew how to, to, to use the, the, the media and, to, to, uh, 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 and, and, and the, the ability to bring international activists and Israeli activists to get together. We won the case. The Israeli court has decided um, to reroute the, face, uh, the, the fence. It was uh, 2007 when we won, um, and, but, but they did not order to reroute the fence uh, as we wanted, adjacent to the, to, the, to the settlement, but rather it made a compromise. So, because there were already new structures that were already built and inhabited by settlers. So basically, the village lost 2,000 uh, dunams, but 1,000 dunams went back. You do the math, it's very simple. I came that day to Belin. It was as if Palestine got freedom, as if a new state was born, as if we won, I don't know, World Cup Series. <laughs> they were juvenilized. 
they were they were partying, they were dancing, there was food. Many many journalists from all around the world. Every every kid gave an interview to Al Jazeera or to BBC, and and they were just. And I thought to myself, what's going on here? I mean, two thousand dunams were taken, one thousand were restored. It's and I thought of the of the Jewish story about the the rabbi and the Hasidic and the and the goat. You all know it. Squash and squeeze. It's cool. Yeah. That's right. They, 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 were, they, they had a, a goat in their house, and now that it's gone, they feel that it's spacious. <laughs> um, and going, driving back from Bilin to Tel Aviv, it's not a long drive, I, I thought to myself, um, what, what did I, I, I know I, I, I intend to do good. I know that I, what I wanted to do was of good intentions, but what did I achieve? The Israeli Ministry of Justice that day issued a, a statement saying, only in Israel, Palestinians can get justice. <laughs> and the Israeli ambassador to the UN uh, also used the, the, the victory uh, as, a, as a Hasbara, as a, as a PR thing. And I, and I thought, maybe, maybe, actually, I am the naive collaborator of the system. Maybe that the, the separation fence became a joint venture between the, the, the government and the army and me. The, they push to one side, I push to another. It's a matrix. Everyone ha does his share. And now when I drive through the, along the separation fence with uh, family to show them, I can tell them, this is a part that I've designed. I know I didn't really design, I didn't sit on the designing table, but I was one of the designers of this segment. <coughs> So and that was the dilemma that I was... And, and it's very powerful because it, it leads you indeed to write the book because it means you then decide to take two years and you move to New York for a while and you write the book. But on this, on this point about the design, it's quite interesting. You said that during the proceedings, you resisted the temptation to actually suggest a route. That's right. But the judges were almost saying to you, all right, will you tell us what route for this wall you'd, you'd be happy with? And it's part, that's partly what you mean about being a, a joint enterprise. That was the first time that my intuition said, oh, wait a minute. They're, they want me to legitimize the project. Yeah. Maybe not in this route, but another. And they actually told me, look, the army says, this is the route they need. This is for security. Please tell us, give us a, give us a way out of this. Tell us what route would you, would you, would you rather. Mm. And I told them the green line, which was a no-go, no starter, because there is a, a, a settlement nearby and no one would be would agree, and I and I told them the green line, and if you want it, you you can you the can green you line can, being the nineteen sixty seven the 1967 line. Line, uh, borders, yeah. and and if if there's a need to protect the settlement, fine, you can encircle it with a fence. <laughs> that was seen like humor for them, so I didn't. Um, there were other lawyers, and and and, and uh, lawyers dif differed in, in that. There were other lawyers, mainly by the way, Palestinian uh, lawyers, uh, Israeli Palestinian lawyers, who were ready to to. Uh, to present an alternative uh, route. I think for them it was, we're anyway negotiating with, uh, right. with the guard. It's not, for me it's the Supreme Court. I, I value the decisions of the Israeli Supreme Court. I know that some of my fellow citizens would listen or hear the outcome of the, of the, mm -hmm. of, of the, and the judgments and would find it to be uh, educative. Uh, probably for passing, it's easier. Yeah, but, but you then, as you say, you wrestle with this dilemma. But the reader is thinking, and you put, put the maths very well, you said, you know, they were going to lose 2,000. Uh, the ideal world, they'd have lost zero. But in the end, they lost 1,000. That's still 1,000 dunams they have that without you being there, they would have lost. And so, in, so on, on its superficially, it doesn't look like that harder dilemma because at least it's better than nothing hence the Palestinians in Berlin themselves celebrating but tell us how you where you got to without giving away the end of the book yes. but tell us how where you got to on this uh, wrestle so, with this dilemma so it it took me 500 pages to reach that conclusion <laughs> I I I, um, I write in the preface to the book that uh, this book was born on the Jerusalem Tel Aviv highway on the way from Jerusalem to Tel Aviv, never from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem, because on the way from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem, I'm uh, uh, I'm concentrating on the case and the and the and the pleadings that I'm going to to uh, to have. But uh, on the way back, it's always the dilemma, with the years growing, the dilemma inside me, trying to figure out. <laughs> did I do the did right I thing? Did I do the right thing? Mm. 
And, and, and somewhere along uh, um, the, the uh, Ben Gurion Airport, I, I leave it because I can't, you know, the competing arguments are so powerful, mm -hmm. I can't figure it out. And I said, one day I will find time to, to, talk, to, to deal with this. And indeed, in the, the, the research for the book and the writing of the book was this kind of a, of a, um, of a process of reflection. And, um, and I think, and, and the idea was to, to look back from the 70s and up to today to learn the history of what were the dilemmas of other lawyers and to interview them. And I made a lot of interviews in order to write this book with uh, veteran lawyers. And I heard their dilemmas and their stories. And eventually, for me, it was, um, it, it, it dawned on me at a certain point exactly what you said. At the bottom of the line, there is um, my um, worldview and my um, uh, belief in human rights. And the human rights philosophy and ethics would not allow me to sacrifice the individual for some greater, by the way, speculative good. So if, if and, and, and I wrote in the book uh, uh, an imaginary um, discussion uh, between a lawyer and, uh, and, a cl and a potential client in which the client wants the lawyer to retain the lawyer in order to have uh, a case um, for family reuni reunification with his wife. And the, and the lawyer says, well, you know, I can't, you have a good case, but I can't do it because the ramifications of, of uh, engaging with this justice system uh, are bad for the cause, hmm. for the cause of ending the occupation, the cause of liberating uh, the occupied people and, and the like. And while I was writing this, I, it, it, it really struck me that this is impossible for me. I would have to become a non-human rights lawyer in order um, to prioritize uh, some uh, collective uh, good over an individual. And the fact is that Palestinians keep on knocking on my door. It's not really true. They can't get into Tel Aviv. So mm -hmm. they call me, they text me, and uh, eventually I can be con cannot be condescending or patronizing. It's their struggle. They will decide how to do it. And one more thing. It took me to write the book to realize that the people of Bil'in understood something that I did not understand. They understood that there is a difference between a victory in court or a defeat in court and a success in uh, the struggle or a failure in the struggle. And that sometimes um, what we have to look in, we, don't, we cannot evaluate the case only by its uh, outcome in the sense of what the judgment is in relation to the remedy sought. We need to look into what are the implications of the, of, of the judgments. And here, because Bilin became a symbol, and because their argument, their, their cries, that this is not a security barrier, it was designed according to, uh, it, it's a lie. And, it, and, and the government lied not only to them, it lied to the Israeli public. And suddenly, the Israeli court has said, yes, you're right, they lied. That was a huge thing. That was a huge thing, and that was not just a victory. That was a success in changing the discourse, in, in, in creating understanding. Uh, because this was a public admission. It wasn't a security barrier. It was a barrier, and they use security sometimes as the pretext to, to, to determine the route. But is your case exposed? Listen, there are things I want to sort of get through quickly, because we do want to open it up. Um, and I also want to make sure, even though probably most of the people in here are fairly like-minded on this, I want to at least put to you what people who are probably not in, who are definitely not in this room, but who... Um, who have written on this sort of thing, put to you their case so that you can push back on it. And the first one I'm thinking is that the premise of everything you've said in terms of occupation and international law, etc., would be challenged. A colleague of mine in the Jewish Chronicle, I'm sure you all know who it is, wrote a column a couple of weeks ago saying the whole notion of calling this occupation is wrong and that there's a new study out which says uh, that um, it's, it's, it's a new work, it's not based on new evidence, but uh, it, how can it possibly be occupied because it was not taken in 1967 from a sovereign entity, Jordan held it, but it wasn't theirs to hold. And anyway, the mandate, the League of Nations mandate going back to 1921 was a mandate over the whole area, and therefore since that's never been repealed, revoked, uh, Jews have the right to settle anywhere in the land of uh, uh, mandatory Palestine as defined then, so both sides of the River Jordan, etc. So that argument uh, was made, and um, you know, since you're an international lawyer and a human rights lawyer, you know this better than anyone. What's your re response to that? Well, first, I would like your friend from the Jewish Chronicle to pay royalties to um, Yuda Bloom. Professor Yuda Bloom was the uh, legal advisor of the uh, foreign Israeli foreign ministry, and he 
sorry for the word, invented that uh, uh, argument, which is based on the notion that a, a certain paragraph in the Fourth Geneva Convention talks about the application of the convention to any kind of occupation from uh, a high contracting party. And he made the argument, and Jordan was a high contracting party to the Geneva Convention, and he made the argument that um, that uh, since Jordan was not the was not acknowledged by the international community, and it was not uh, that uh, um, as a sovereign in the West Bank, it annexed it in violation of international law, right. and that's true. Um, then this this paragraph does not apply, and si and hence the Geneva Convention does not apply. That argument was dismissed by the entire entire international community by the ICRC, the, 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 Red Cro the International uh, Committee of the Red Cross, which is the guardian of international humanitarian law, by the International Court of Justice, by almost every scholar around the world. And the reason is simple. The definition of occupation is not in the Geneva Convention. The definition of occupation is in the, I don't want to get too technical, but in the Fourth Hague Convention. And, that, and, and, and the definition says that occupation uh, 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 stretches to every land that the army, uh, in the, the invading army, has effective control over. That is the only question that has to be replied in order to uh, ascertain whether a certain area is under occupation or not. But I, uh, I, want to, I don't want just to be technical about this. I want to ask a person who makes that claim, fine, it's not an occupation. So what is it? What is it? What is the normative framework that applies? How do you keep millions of people for 50 years without civil rights. I, I have a friend in Berlin. He was my client, now he's my friend. Uh, he's almost my age, he has two kids like me. My kids visit his kids and they, they know each other. They don't, they don't speak uh, Hebrew, he doesn't speak, my kids do not speak Arabic, but they speak the international language of soccer. And, um, and this guy that has, he's now a lawyer in Palestine. Since I was 18, I voted eight times to the Israeli Knesset. Eight times I went to the ballot and chose representatives that would be part of the process that uh, uh, create the norms that govern my life and my family's life. He has not done that even once. What is the normative framework that this guy from the, uh, the, 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 the columnist from the Jewish Chronicle has in mind that allows this? Yeah. And what, what, the, what are the implications? So what next? While you're pushing back on those arguments, the other one we mentioned is your involvement in the case uh, about the, the clashes, as they would be reported, the killings on the Gaza frontier. Uh, the world saw them. They happened on the day of the 70th anniversary on the secular calendar of the establishment of the State of Israel. And they happened when the, the yeah. you'll remember, the screen was split and there were pictures of the dedication ceremony of the new U.S. Embassy in Jerusalem, and on the other half of the screen were these really bloody scenes uh, in Gaza, and over 60 killed in a single day. Um, the argument made uh, was that, you know, of course Israel regrets every death, but yes, live ammunition was used, because what are you going to do, and you, England, Britain, would make the same choice if there were people rushing your border with a view to com coming through the border, and the Hamas leader had, had famously said to, you know, in Arabic, on, through in a broadcast, go, meet, you know, find Israeli civilians, rip their hearts out, etc. So, it's not, it's, this would be the argument, it's not pretty, it doesn't look good, it <coughs> makes a bad impression on, Isra on international TV, but every country in the world would do the same if their border was rushed. <coughs> what do you, what, what's your response to that? <coughs> well, first of all, uh, Israeli defense forces, Israeli... Um, armed forces have not only the right but the obligation to protect the state of Israel, Israeli civilians, and they are entitled to use force in order to achieve that goal. This is not the question. The question is what kind of force and in what circumstances it can be used. Now, what we know about uh, in the, the, the open fire regulations uh, in Israel, probably like in other places, are classified. But um, um, in, the, in the weeks leading to the, the uh, March 31st, the first day of those uh, the marches, those demonstrations, the Israeli, um, there was a, um, a, a tsunami of tweets and posts 
uh, and interviews by uh, Israeli generals and by Israeli politicians, including the Minister of Defense, including the Prime Minister himself and, and his spokespersons, um, suggesting that um, Israeli snipers will uh, use potentially lethal force, meaning live ammunition, uh, against quote unquote central provocateurs. Mm. Now, use of force, use of leth <coughs> potentially lethal force under law, under international law, under laws of Israel, I think under any uh, laws of any civilized nation, what is called, mm. uh, can only be used to protect life. So there is ne a need for imminent danger to life in order to use, in order to risk life. It's very simple. Life is so sacred that we are willing to risk it in order to save life, not, to, not in order to save anything else. And so our argument, and I represented uh, four Israeli uh, human rights organizations in this case together with colleagues of mine, and there was another petition by Adala and, and a Gazan uh, uh, human rights organization. Mm -hmm. uh, our argument was the following. The rules of, 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 uh, uh, of um, the open fire regulations, um, when it comes to civilians, must adhere to this very basic principle that is enshrined in, in, in UN uh, uh, guiding principles that have a customary status, um, that, that lethal force can only be used against someone who poses an imminent danger to life. When, when people storm at the fence, there are many um, non-lethal um, um, tools that can be used, you know, fire guns and tear gas, and there, there, believe me, there are many, many types that Israel uses in the West Bank and in other places. It's not the first riot. It's not the first country that, that is, is, is uh, uh, facing violent riots. And, uh, and Israel has chosen not to use it because they wanted the crowd, they wanted a, a buffer zone that is longer, bigger than the effective, the effective range of the non-lethal uh, uh, um, tools. Be, <laughs> I understand that, but wouldn't it, would it have even been a factor, do you think, in the minds of the people who took that decision, that, because you used the word before about Hasbara, that this is just going to look terrible for Israel. The day of this big ceremony, we can do this, that you just said, it will give us a bigger buffer zone, we use live ammunition, but dozens will die. Does anybody sit around that table, that operational table? I'm not asking for that there be a moral discussion, whether this is morally right. I'm one, just wondering if the, your understanding is that they even consider the implications for Israel's standing in the world of making a decision like that. I haven't sat around that table, <laughs> so, so it's difficult for me to answer. I think, first of all, I think they may have been um, wrong in assessing what will happen. May, they may have thought that uh, a certain amount of casualties will deter the rest. And to be honest, I would expect that people seeing that this kind of force is being used, they would not come anywhere close to the, to the fence. It just begs the question, what's happening there in Gaza? What do these people are going through in 11 years of this, of, of this siege? that makes them uh, uh, risk their lives and go bare-handed. Bare I mean, there is no argument that, that these people were armed. If they were armed, my position would be different. They were not armed. And yet, there was, and this again, it was a talking point that was said afterwards. After the event, Hamas themselves claimed 50 yeah. of them are ours, 13 Islamic Jihad, yeah. etc. Or three maybe was Islamic, Palestinian Islamic Jihad. Well, well, how, how do you square that with the notion that they were unarmed, they were civilians, they were protesters? You know, I, I, um, every, every one of us has um, cultural and uh, um, social um, uh, experience that, um, that is the, the middlemen that, yeah. that through which yes. the reality goes through. So I, I, I grew up as an Israeli, so I speak Israeli. When I see things, I translate it in, the, in an Israeli uh, uh, mind. Mm -hmm. When I began uh, um, uh, representing Palestinians, and I gradually learned Palestinianism, okay? And I understood how they see things. When you say Hamas, when an Israeli hears the word Hamas, all he thinks about is a terror organization, rightly so, that uh, sends people to explode in buses and cafes. 
For Palestinians, Hamas is part of the society. Saying that someone is Hamas is not saying that he's a member of the military wing, that right. he is waging uh, armed uh, 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 war against Israel. It may be that a person, definitely in Gaza, who wanted to get a job, had to become a member of the Hamas. Or that he identifies with the idea, ideas that Hamas uh, promotes. That is not a capital punishment offense. So you made these arguments through the Israeli court system and tell us how that worked out for you. It was very difficult, and and, and and to be fair, it's not an easy uh, it's not an easy case for the judges as well. I mean, I understand the kind of corner that I'm pushing them into. Um, I, I'm not sorry for doing this. I think you know they got um, um, they have uh, uh, independence and they have a lot of power and they should uh, use it right and be bold. Uh, and yet I understand that it's not an easy thing. And they came up with some kind of a, of a, of a judgment that, uh, on, on the one hand, dismissed the petitions, did not intervene in the rules of engagement, but on the other hand, did not rule that the uh, open fire regulations were legal. What they said was, we cannot scrutinize this when the events are ongoing. We do not have enough information and data about what's going on there. The legality of the open fire regulations are uh, are very much connected to the, to, the, to the facts. And only after a post facto review, after we have inquiries and we know more about what's happened, only then we could uh, seriously determine uh, the legality of, of, the, of these uh, regulations. I mean, this get, I'm going to go to question quite soon. This gets us to something very interesting about the Supreme Court, and on the court system, and particularly the Supreme Court, and how we should see them. Because I, I know that I, maybe other people in this room, often hold out or cling to, hold up the Supreme Court as an example of one of the institutions that's sort of holding the line in Israel and, and enforcing you know, norms and good standards of human rights and you know the politicians sometimes are pushing things in a bad direction and you hold, look to them to hold the line. What comes through in what you've written is that actually sometimes they are, and it's a version of the dilemma you yourself felt on that drive back <laughs> uh, to Tel Aviv, are they in some ways not a bulwark of resistance to occupation and the, some of the uh, the drift aw away from human rights, but actually enablers of that pattern. And how should how should we, particularly people outside the country who are used to admiring the Supreme Court, how, in your view, should we look at that institution? The Israeli Supreme Court is a very important institution, which uh, um, the the decline of uh, presents a huge danger to the Israeli what is left of the of the Israeli democracy. Um, but its record should be uh, reviewed um, uh, truthfully. Uh, and its record when it comes to the occupied territories is a very me very problematic one. The Israeli Supreme Court has koshered almost every uh, practice and every policy Israel has implemented in the West Bank. It enabled the monster of, 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 of the uh, settlement uh, project. It uh, allowed almost every uh, um, um, policy that violated uh, uh, basic rights of Palestinians, including house demolitions, which is a collective punishment uh, yeah. of families, and so on and so forth. It has, however, and this is uh, why its record is mixed, it has, however, sketched a few lines, uh, red lines. One of them being uh, the protection of uh, Palestinian property and not using Palestinian property for settlement purposes. Um, Another, another line, very important one that it sketched was um, torture. The, um, the famous uh, 1999 uh, torture case in which it outlawed five physical techniques, very similar to techniques used by uh, the UK in, in, Northern, by in UK and Northern Ireland, um, and was uh, uh, found to be illegal by the European Court of uh, Human Rights. Illegal. Uh, illegal, to found European to be Court, illegal yes. by the European Court of Human Rights. Yeah. Um, there are these several outstanding decisions. You can all read of them because they were translated to English. One day I will publish the book of the uh, decisions not translated to English by the Supreme Court, and I will translate them to, to the English so that all of you can read it too. Um, and then there is another thing that has to be said about the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court um, is a very important institution in which Palestinians can get remedy in what we call in the shadow of the court, not through final 
rulings that uh, uh, that uh, make a decision and coerce the government to do that way or another, but in a kind of mediation process that the judges are uh, are engaging in. A Palestinian may send letters, may ask, uh, apply for certain things, and would not even get an answer because he's a nobody floating in the air, has nothing, no weight. And then he lawyers up, hmm. and he goes to court, and suddenly he's somebody. And the and the and the and the uh, 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 the state is negotiating with him. And if the judges say a word in, in in the hearing and put a pressure on on the state attorney, he will get something. He will get some remedy. This is, by the way, the oxygen that makes Palestine go back to court. So I think there are hundreds of thousands of Palestinians that can say that they got something from court proceedings. So it's a mixed record, but mainly a very big enabler. Absolutely. Yeah, as you say, kosher and giving it to decisions that uh, people here would often want to oppose. Okay, the last thing I'm going to ask before we open it out is you've given us um, an account which a lot of people will you know, find very sobering, even dispiriting, uh, the notion that you, know, you even said about the Supreme Court, it's under pressure, you know, even if it's got this role which is not entirely positive, it's, even that is hard because Netanyahu and the other politicians are trying to choke it off and appoint people of often right-wing judges. Um, it can feel sometimes like this is a bit of a lost cause. Mm. Um, how, how do you yourself not get kind of depressed by it? Uh, how do you keep your own spirits up? And crucially, I think for people sitting here in London, what can they do, what can we do to help you? Okay. <laughs> <coughs> Well, first of all, I, I want to share with you a slogan that I use in, uh, in, in, in my office uh, because, well, there are two slogans. One is, uh, if you want to get depressed, find out first if, if it's your turn. You cannot <laughs> all get depressed together. And the second thing is the following. The, the, the reason why we're depressed is because um, we're rational creatures and we are looking at reality and we are identifying that it is that the situation is deteriorating so we see we see the vector we see the the, the direction that it takes now the first thing i want to say about this is if you're in a car and the car is sliding to the abyss that does and and you 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 see that the car is constantly going down that's not a good enough reason to take off your foot from the brakes the fact that we're deteriorating doesn't mean that what we're doing is not doesn't have any effect. Doesn't mean that maybe without what we're doing, things would be even worse. Mm -hmm. So that's one thing. Even before I even before I sketch for you a a, uh, um, a theory of change, it's important to say even if you don't believe that a change is in the foreseeable future, mm -hmm. it does not enable us to stop resisting and stop fighting to end this. Um, so having, so everybody is now recruited to stop the occupation, even if you don't believe that this is something that will happen. But I want to say more than this. I think that this rational logic that says things are going to the wrong direction, hence it will continue to go to the wrong way. The fact that things are going to a certain direction is not a proof that it will continue to do this. This, first of all. And second, I believe that the occupation inherently is an is a is a non is an uh, non it, it's not sustainable situation for for a long time. There is something about keeping millions of people rightless, stripped of their rights, that makes it inherently a not stable uh, 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 situation. And um, and I think that I have a theory that uh, that while we see the the the, the ground is stable and we think that everything we know everything about what's going on and we don't see any signs of change and we're expecting if, if, if I'm telling you that the occupation will one day end you expect to see signs of, of this mag magnificent change when you go somewhere you want to see that you're 50 miles away 40 miles away you want to see road signs and we don't see them well my my uh, uh, theory is that we don't see them because they're underneath the surface, these ro so road signs. These are small cracks that are created. It's the Security Council Resolution uh, 2334 uh, that, uh, uh, that was the biggest loss Israel ever uh, had regarding the, 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 the occupation, which stipulated that the occupation, uh, that the settlements are illegal and the occupation 
uh, uh, covers both the West Bank and East Jerusalem and, uh, and calls on states to differentiate uh, Israel from the occupied territories in their relationship. It's about the regularization law. That is another seismic event. It's not something, if, if everything was fine, they, didn't, they wouldn't need this, right? Explain more better. The, 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 the law that I uh, told about before, which confiscates lands and allocates yeah. it to, to, to settlers. So I think, and, and if I go to, uh, for example, American campuses, I've been to America on advocacy trips, I think for the last 12 years, several times. At first, it was very difficult to criticize the policy of the government of Israel in, in, in rooms filled with 30 or 20 something uh, year old students. Today, it's difficult to say good things about Israel. I get pushback when I, when I compliment some things about the Israeli society. I think there is a there is a change in the way international uh, civil society is looking at this. Yachat and the new uh, and, and J Street are two in, uh, organizations that were not existing several years ago. The the monopoly on the Jewish voice regarding Israel has completely broken. This is a very positive uh, thing. So these cracks that we don't see them, and I became a human seismograph. I'm listening mm -hmm. to the ground, and I'm finding these cracks everywhere. One day, these cracks will combine. And what is important for you to understand, what I propose to you, is that the change would, be, would not be linear. It will happen in one way, just like the Berlin Wall fell without anyone uh, expecting it, right. just like the apartheid regime fell. Uh, uh, and, and two weeks before, no one would say that it will. Mm. Um, and um, and in order for us to to bring, the, we don't, we can't wait for this day. We have to bring that day. And in order to do that, we need to create more cracks. And and the work of creating cracks is not solely the role of Israeli uh, 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 peace activists or human rights activists. It's also the role of the international community. It's also the role of Jewish communities around the world that have a very very important. Uh, uh, role and their voice is heard in Israeli politics. It's not a decisive voice, but it is a voice, and it is very important that that Jewish communities and Jewish leaders around the world will be heard criticizing Israel, not silencing criticism, differentiating between legitimate criticism and, and anti-Semitism, of course, but making your voice heard, coming to Israel. S meeting the, the, the NGOs that work on, on the ground. This is the biggest uh, defense shield that we have against the currents that want to drown us and silence us, is the fact that we have partners. We have uh, partners that, that come here and they see it and they know it, the, 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 the pro-settler lo lobby. And that creates the, the borders of, of, of what, that sketches the borders of what they can and cannot do to us. Come to Israel. Send your uh, your young uh, sons and daughters not only to birthright, or if possible, not to birthright, but uh, uh, to to do work with B'Tselem, with breaking the silence, with Yeshdin, with peace. Now, this is extremely important, uh, and of course, have your parliament member hear your voice too, because eventually, this is not an internal. Israeli affair. The occupation is something that would determine the soul of the Israeli society, but it is not a, an internal Israeli affair. It's an international conflict, and the international community not only has a right, but an obligation to be involved in it. Thank you. That's a terrific point to open it up, and of course the organizations you mentioned, Yaka. message about those international groups that take people and are making their voice heard, of course, yeah, of course the New Israel Fund and Yachad both completely involved in that. Let's take some questions. I've got lots more to follow up, but we'll take it from the lady here. Oh, do we have the microphone moving around, or should we just ask you to speak up? No microphone, so just project in theatrical ways. Because the question, ways. just from what you were saying, Israel very often says, we do this and that, because otherwise we'll cease to exist. Now, you are saying you believe, and I believe too, that one day, there will be a day when the occupation will end. Right. But where does the two... Okay, don't, don't answer that yet, yeah, straight away, because I want to take a, yeah, a sure. set. We'll hear from you, yeah. and then you, yeah. Yeah, and one of the um, remarks that you made, uh, among many very interesting uh, remarks, were that um, in the recent uh, litigation with respect to the use of live fire on the, on the Gaza border, 
um, the judges said that the judges didn't have enough data in order to, to make a decision. Um, my understanding from that litigation was that um, disclosure of the rules of engagement was proposed by the IDF but was opposed by the plaintiffs on the basis that if that disclosure were made, it was going to become, or it was going to be an ex parte disclosure, a disclosure to the judges only without uh, the plaintiffs having the opportunity to, to review the rules of engagement themselves. Uh, if, if that was your tactical decision, I'm, I'm just interested to know why you, you elected to make that tactical decision in the, in the uh, litigation and uh, what, what your view of the judges' um, decision was in light of that. Thank you, it's very precise, and we've got a question here. Yeah. You, Beth. Um, so you've spoken very movingly about the potential role for the international community. The UN Human Rights Council recently voted for an independent investigation into the protest at the fence, but Netanyahu has refused to cooperate, kind of called it all, um, said it's all very biased, and suggested instead an internal IDF investigation. Um, is there any hope for in kind of effective intervention by the international community? The, the international community is very split. There's kind of trade, economic, diplomatic interests. Is there any hope for that in the current political landscape? Can I answer them? Sure. So I, I, I'll start with uh, the question about the litigation just because I want to take it Bear in mind, not everyone on my chest as a, as a legal expert. So right. So I'll, I'll, be, I'll be short. It's just not true. Um, I mean, the, the what happened was that uh, we asked the court to uh, see the open fire regulations and we were ready that they will see it ex parte and also get uh, explanations about it. What the IDF has asked is in addition to that they wanted to give a, an intelligence brief to the judges without us present. We said we oppose that the intelligence brief would be presented ex parte because the question of legality of, of, of the open fire regulations is not depending on what the intelligence says about the intentions of, of the, the protesters. Uh, uh, an open fire regulation may be legal or illegal and it has to apply to every, to every scenario. And so the judges were the ones who said if you don't allow us to see that we will not, uh, we'll also not look at the open fire regulations. But that was not important because the open fire, the question that, posed to the, that was posed to the court was not in dispute. That the open fire regulations allow targeting a central provocateur. That was the question. Whether they saw how it is drafted or not was not really important. Um, but this goes to something you write about in the book, which is the extent to which the courts do defer to the security establishment and to the military and their needs. You say that happens again and again. All the time. There is no, you know, uh, there is a saying in, in, in Israeli right wing that the court is, the, is a branch of, uh, of merits, the progressive liberal party. Um, there is no bigger lie in the history of, of, of Israel. The court is not a branch of merit, it's not a branch of the labor, it's not a branch of Likud, it's a branch of the security establishment. This is the, the one, uh, 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 if, if we're looking for a, a, a uh, one, uh, ele one guiding uh, 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 principle that would tell us what the court would uh, uh, rule like, look for what does the security establishment think about the case. If a case has nothing to do with the security, then it's open. Can I just come back to you just very quickly on that? Because it, in the UK, it, it, it wouldn't be unheard of or uncommon at all in a, in a case which is critical to national security for public interest immunity to prevent disclosure to claimants in an administrative uh, review case. So from, from, a, from an English legal perspective, it, it doesn't appear particularly unusual that you would deny the disclosure of the intelligence briefing um, in, in this litigation. We, we, and, and we don't say that our courts are a, a vehicle of the security establishment. Well, some do, but, but they're at the extreme fringes. I, 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 there, there was no dispute that we're not entitled to see the, the intelligence brief. The question was whether this is relevant to the litigation. It was not relevant to the litigation. The question of what the intelligence knows about the Hamas and its uh, intentions regarding the, the the demonstration has nothing to do with the question of whether the open fire regulations are legal or not. So this is why we opposed it, not for any other reason. So in principle, you didn't have an objection, as the no. question saying, to there being some intelligence material you can't look at. No, not at all. This okay. was not the question. Good. Now, what, what, as for, good. let me just get to the yes. other two questions uh, regarding your question. Um, look, I, I understand the the concern. Um, 
that Israel is a small country, it has uh, uh, many enemies, and it has to maintain security, and withdrawal from the West Bank might create some uh, uh, security risks, if I understood your question right. Uh, um, the Israeli-Palestinian conflict is the biggest risk to the, uh, to the existence of the State of Israel. Mm -hmm. It's not just a security risk, or not predominantly a security risk. It's a risk to our moral backbone. Because eventually, this, this society, any society, cannot sustain for long um, an immoral uh, uh, regime over millions of people. So I would, I would say that the biggest security threat to the state of Israel is the moral threat, that we will collapse as a, as a, as a, as a moral entity. And so, Ending the occupation is an existential uh, interest of the State of Israel. And as for your um, question uh, about um, the, the investigations, um, so yeah, I mean Israel has uh, is now has a has a history of uh, of uh, not uh, uh, cooperating with international fact finding missions and inquiries uh, and the like. Um, the biggest threat is that, um, and we're seeing that, is that the world um, will lose, lose interest. Um, you have, I, I think I wrote in the book some of the, of, of the headlines in the Israeli newspapers on, the, on November 9th, 2016. November 8th being the election of Donald Trump. Everything that happens now was already written back then. The Israeli right celebrated as if the Messiah has arrived mm -hmm. and said, now we can do all those things that we couldn't do before. We will take all the plans from the deep freeze and we will defreeze them and we will implement them. I want to add to that, Europe is busy with a, a refugee crisis and with Brexit. Mm -hmm. This combination of Trump being in the White House and Europe being busy with other stuff Britain is also busy. I have to say, since I arrived here on Thursday, I read everything I could. I looked at all bo news bulletins. I don't understand what's going on. <laughs> I, I really, I, I, truly, I tried, but I, I just don't understand anything. Thank, thank God I have some cousins who explained to me some of the... Please connect us with them. <laughs> they understand it. We want to hear from them. So, so th this is a big, big, big danger because the only, or one of the main... Um, limitations on re realizing the annexationist fantasy um, of creating a de jure apartheid, not a, a, a de facto one, is if the world will signal to Israel, we just don't care. Um, let's take some more. We've limited time, but I'm going to try and take as many as you can. So I can see a hand here, the lady there, and a man just behind you. So we'll have both of you. Yeah, you first, yeah. Me. No, the lady oh, there. Okay. Yes, it, it, loud okay. as you can, yeah. Picking up the point about widening the plans, one of the extraordinary things from the point, from the diaspora point of view, is that people like us in this room can go into the West Bank and see what is going on there. And it has an incredible impact on you to actually go in there. Can you explain why it is that ordinary Israelis can't go in in the way that we can go in because that to me seems to be the main route to widening the practice. Thank you and gentlemen behind you yeah uh, yeah a, an interesting article two months ago in the New York Jewish paper The Forge by an academic lawyer who was saying mainstream American Jewish communities always had a reflexive concern for Israel's welfare he says Times have completely changed. Israel doesn't care a damn what the American Jewish community thinks, let alone what the British Jewish community thinks, because we're irrelevant for Netanyahu in the right wing. He says he's got the American evangelical right wing totally behind his policies. They were there at the opening of the Jerusalem embassy. So uh, Netanyahu is really saying, we couldn't get a damn what you liberal 
uh, British American Jews thing. Okay. Uh, it's well, we'll bring that back to the point you made. I saw yeah. a, a hand over here, and I wanted to make sure. Did I see one of our younger people here with a hand up? No, heads raised, but not a question. We're going to keep it with people over here. Oh, then. Yes. Older. I'm older. Pretend to be younger. Yeah. Yeah. No, I'm, I'm very younger. You talked a bit about the regulariz regularization law, and you seemed mildly optimistic that the court may overturn it. More recently, I've been worried as a supporter of both Beth Salem and breaking the silence about a new proposal that anybody who does anything which might undermine the morale of an Israeli soldier would be deemed to be illegal. Can you say a little bit about that legislation, where it stands, and, and whether you think it, it, it's, it's having Thank you. A and then, effect? sorry, I'm cutting off just because I want to make sure. Order. I'm going to remind you of all of them, and I'm going to actually combine a couple of them. Question here, yeah. Thanks. Uh, this you, will be you, the last one, I think. Uh, uh, compelling points uh, in your book about, you've talked about it today, about the disregard for international law, particularly the Geneva Conventions and uh, by the government and the courts. Uh, there's a new uh, focus now uh, on the international from the International Criminal Court, having finally been able to say we recognize jurisdiction. Is that one of the cracks that you think, and do you have much hope that that will in fact push this uh, issue forward? Thank you. So let's two of those at least related to the diaspora, and you very stirringly said these people like the people in this room should be involved, and the questioner said actually isn't the reality that Israel Netanyahu doesn't listen, doesn't care. Uh, about the diaspora because he has his evangelical friends and if you could address that and perhaps also this point about why can Israelis not go to these places that actually people here very much can go to. So I'm not a, po a political analyst and I'm not an expert on the Jewish, is Jewish diaspora Israeli relationship. All I can give you is my testimony and my feelings on the ground. I know that uh, our um, partners in, in, in the Jewish communities around the world and our partnership with them provides us with a lot of strength vis-a-vis -vis the Israeli government and in court. I know that when I go and uh, uh, speak to a uh, community, a, prog a, a, a progressive community in, in New York or in San Francisco, I know that uh, th there are people from the Israeli embassy that are cabling back to Jerusalem because this is an important, these are important communities of people that have stature, people who, are, uh, uh, who have influence in America. And so it might be that the strength and the the power of the Jewish communities uh, in England and, and, and in uh, America mm -hmm. uh, is not the same as it was uh, in the past. I don't think, it, I, th I think mainly uh, uh, the, it, it's, a, it's a matter of the current coalition and its disregard to different streams in, 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 in Judaism. This is the main issue here. But I still, uh, my, my experience is that uh, when I uh, um, use names, with permission of course, of uh, leaders, of rabbis around uh, uh, the country, around the world, in my work, it does matter. That's my, uh, uh, as for Israelis, Israelis can go to the West Bank. They cannot go to Area A without a permit, uh, because this is how um, the military uh, law um, uh, this, uh, stipulates. Um, but they can go to the to the to the West Bank, and they do go to the West Bank. In in, in I mean, every every week there are busloads of Israelis um, going on breaking the silent uh, silence tours to Hebron and other places. Most Israelis don't care. Most Israelis don't don't want to know much about uh, the backyard that is the West Bank. They, the 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 empty half uh, um, part of the cup is that indeed they don't care. They wouldn't go out of their ways to stop this process, to stop settlements, to end the occupation. But the, 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 the full half of the cup is that they would not go out of their ways and would not go out to the street to defend the settlements if a decision comes to, to evacuate them. There is enough information that is disseminated. If an Israeli wants to know, they know. And this is the, the, the challenge that we have in the in civil society uh, and in the NGO community to make people understand they have to know. Just this is going to be the yes. very last thing. Tie together these two legal developments. One, a new law that appears to be going through that says it could be a crime to undermine the morale of a soldier. Yeah. That could silence groups like the ones you've mentioned. And then this development with the ICC having some uh, purchase on the conflict. It goes to the point about international 
groups and whether that is something that is okay beginning. I think you'll get the way of my thinking when I'll say that both the ICC and these kind of legislations are cracks. These are these are exemplify cracks. These exemplify how the the, the legislation, not specifically that legislation, but the the hordes of bills that are uh, going through Parliament, through the Knesset, trying to silence, trying to put barriers on speech, trying to stop funding of Israeli NGOs, trying to uh, uh, label uh, Israeli NGOs as foreign uh, uh, agents. Uh, I'm the legal advisor of Yesh Din. Yesh Din now, whenever I issue a letter uh, on behalf of Yesh Din to an official in Israel, I have to write down, according by law, I have to, to say that uh, Yesh Din is funded by uh, uh, foreign governmental entities. Of course, I write something different. Yesh Din is proudly uh, is proud to have among its donors uh, democratic nations that are allies of the state of Israel, and we promise that not even one cent of our money comes from casinos and from other dubious. Uh, so this is this is how I form that uh, disclosure. Uh, but this is a crack. This is an attempt to. This is a the, the government is ready to sacrifice for the for the annexation project to sacrifice the biggest, the most important currency it has, the, 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 the image of Israel as a democratic, the only democracy in the Middle East. It is ready to pay in that currency. This is a big crack. And then the ICC. I, I, I tend to say that Israelis, uh, when they go to sleep at night, they have, there are two demons that chase them. They are both three-letter acronyms, ICC and BDS. Mm -hmm. If they would know what I know about the BDS and the ICC, they would sleep very well at night. <laughs> but they don't. And uh, one of the major, one of the major um, uh, um, successes of those two things is that they are really frightening to Israelis. They, Israelis look at the ICC and every hiccup by the, by the uh, uh, prosecutor um, of the ICC is the reported in, 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 in top headlines in Israel and every, and every uh, 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 um, uh, Israeli merchandise that is being taken out of the shelves in, I don't know, Washington state is immediately the end of, of, of the world in Israel. These are psychological things that have to do with what people know also about how the decline of the apartheid, for example. Um, and so I am worried about these legislations naturally. Um, most of these legislation eventually don't pass. Some of them do pass, and there are those who pass, but there are many of them do not pass, and yet their damage is the chilling effect that they create. And I'll end with that. There are many, many, many decent Israelis. Really, many, many decent Israelis who oppose these things. But like in any society, not all decent people are also brave. And not all decent Israelis would risk their position in the academia or wherever in order to uh, uh, publicly support breaking the silence. But there are those who do. And this is a struggle that is waged day by day. And you, if you read Haaretz in English, if you read Jerusalem Post, you'll see the reports from the front line. Um, I just want to say we're about to hear from Hannah from Yaha, but before we do, you mentioned people, many Israelis are decent, not all of them are brave. It's very clear to everybody who's heard you tonight that you are not only a decent Israeli, but very clearly a brave Israeli. <laughs>